Yo, what is happening, everyone? Welcome back to Hours of Movies. My name is Brian. I hope you are having a good day, a good night, a good evening, a good whatever it is at the moment. Today, I'll be talking about Spider-Man, released in 2002, directed by Sam Raimi, and the screenplay is by David Coep. It stars Tobey Maguire as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man, William Dafoe, or Actually, let me say that again. Willem Dafoe as Norman Osborn, Green Goblin. Kristen Dunst as Mary Jane Watson. James Franco as Harry Osborn. Cliff Robertson as Ben Parker. Rosemary Harris as Mary Parker. And including J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson. I know he's only in the movie for maybe about five minutes, but that just goes to show how, you know, iconic J.K. Simmons made J.J. Jonathan out to be. I mean, he's back in the newer Spider-Man films with Tom Holland, so obviously he is universally loved as J.J. And yeah, I mean, as a kid, when I saw this movie as a seven-year-old, he was goddamn hilarious to me. Now, if you don't know what Spider-Man is or who he is, I'll just give you a brief synopsis of, or not synopsis, just a summary of what this Spider-Man movie's about. I mean, they're all practically the same, just a little different. Here we have Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man. He ends up getting his powers when he went to a museum with his school gangs, you know, his friend, well, his one friend, Harry, and then everyone else just hated him. Like that, that, that intro always made me laugh that the bus driver is a dick to Tobey Maguire as well. I mean, you're a grown ass adult. These are 18 year olds, 17, 18, 19 year olds that he's that, you know, he's having fun with while they're tormenting another, you know, 18-year-old is just fucked up, right? But anyways, his school goes to a museum, and he gets bitten by a genetically enhanced spider that gives him super powers like a spider. Walk on walls, shoot webs out his hands, and this one, he doesn't make any mechanical device to help him shoot out webbing. Um, Sam Raimi was like, I really don't want to go into explanation how a kid just created this, you know, so let's just give him webbings already in his hand. And I like it. I mean, I think it's better than the mechanical webbing thing, but obviously it takes away from, you know, Spider-Man and certain situations where he'll run out and he needs to figure out how to like win just using his brains and his muscles and agility instead of the webbings. So yeah, and he eventually becomes a superhero named Spider-Man. But while this is happening, his best friend, Harry Osborn, dad, Norman Osborn, takes a, you know, a, it's almost like the super soldier serum. I mean, it's the same universe, so it probably is just like different, right? I don't remember. Uh, sometimes these little facts just like leave my mind when I need them the moment, you know, exactly when I need them, like right now. But no, but he enhances himself, makes him a lot more... Um, stronger, faster, unbeatable. I mean, he's in almost every way stronger than Spider-Man, considering, you know, this is Tobey Maguire's first couple months as a superhero, and um, Norman just got the juice and cheated his way into supervillain stardom. But yeah, you know, they both have to deal with each other, but Peter Parker has to learn how to live a normal life while juggling being Spider-Man. And it's a lot more grounded than the other films, which makes me like it, I guess. Um, I guess mainly also because I grew up watching these films. I mean, I was seven for this one. And by the time Spider-Man 3 came out, you know, five years later, I was like 12. And now here I am just loving every moment. I, obviously, the Andrew Garfield ones aren't as great as they should be, but it's okay. I mean, Spider-Man's still fun, but Tom Holland, you know, those are... Those are freaking awesome. But honestly, for me, it goes with like this Spider-Man or not even this Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, then like Spider-Verse. Spider-Verse is a dope Spider-Man movie. One of the best. Anyways, I'm just getting sidetracked. But yeah, you know, I uh, do I like this movie? Of course. I mean, I'm like pretty much praising it. Um, there's a lot of good things about it. I think overall, the CGI still holds up a bit. There's a couple moments where it looks a little bit more like a video game or a bit bland but hey i mean what do you expect from a movie that's almost 20 years old it turns 19 this year so that's fucking wild yeah it turns 20 years old next year damn time flies so 
it's it's a good thing the CGI still holds up, especially in the moments where it needs to be, I guess, like the close-up moments where Spider-Man is dodging blades from Green Goblin or when they're sort of bouncing around in the hot air balloons during the World's Fair. So at least certain scenes like that still look good. Obviously, there's a couple moments where it looks a little bit shit or... There's that one scene everyone loves to point out after the World's Fair when Spider-Man saves Mary Jane Watson. And as they're flying through the city, her hair is blowing the opposite direction. And then that's not even Tobey Maguire holding her. It's just a dummy, you could tell, because it's just not even breathing. It's un- it's not a human. It's a-, it's a dummy. So, you know, obviously there's things like that, but you can't really hate on it, can you? A lot of movies are going to have that. But hey, yeah, the CGI is dope. Uh, particularly, um, I probably said that wrong, but anyways, I like, or I adore the characters mainly because they feel a lot more realistic compared to what kind of superhero films you get mainly, you know, um, Peter Parker, what I always liked about this one is that he is a regular Joe Schmo. He's just trying to get through life, pay rent. Luckily he has Harry and they sort of share a apartment a condo i don't know it's huge and i'm pretty sure harry's paying most of it or not harry but norman is probably paying for all of it most likely i'm pretty sure they mention it but you know he's just a regular dude trying to get through life trying to get through school um he keeps getting fired from his jobs because he's always running late stopping criminals so that's what i really like about this peter parker he's a lot more like us like if we were to get a super power the next day we want to become heroes but we're always late to work we're always late to meetings we're always late to meet up with a gathering on thanksgiving and you know i think that's why spider-man 2 is the greatest superhero movie of all time but i'm just like i'm gonna just jump ahead if i continue on that sentence so we'll just leave it at that then we also have willem dafoe who is just superb in this uh this movie was my introduction to him and boy was he terrifying i mean from the moment he kills Dr. Strom, it just set fear to me. Dude looks demonic when you see him. I mean, he has that evil face. But the way he just, Dr. Jekylls and Mr. Hides himself throughout the film when he's talking to himself or just like having arguments with like his reflection. It's just good. It's overall a wonderful acting by Willem Dafoe. I mean, dude anything he's in i'm in like i'll watch it he's one of those actors where it doesn't matter how bad the movie is i'm pretty sure he's gonna be great the boondock saints gets a lot of hate like people hate that fucking movie but i enjoy it mainly because well one i love action movies so if you give me an action flick whatever i'm in but willem dafoe playing like uh like what is he? he i don't even think he's schizophrenic i think he's just like is he? I don't know, but he's just playing a whacked out FBI cop uh, agent. It's been a while since I've seen the movie, but he plays one of those agents trying to figure out who like the Bundan Seis are, like the two brothers causing a ruckus. But he is terrific in it. I mean, he's terrific in a Florida project. He's terrific in a short film called The Smiling Man, which you can find on YouTube. Just type in Willem Dafoe smiling and it'll give you like a eight minute short of him where he can't stop smiling it's creepy yet wonderful i mean dude just brings his a game all the time and i'm just glad that dude this dude just gave us a great green goblin uh i green goblin is my personal favorite spider-man villain just because of willem dafoe before it used to be um it used to be electro because of a video game i played as a kid and he was super hard so i thought that was cool but when I was seven, I'm like, damn, Green Goblin, this is the guy that's it. And it's also a, wonder, a wonderful take on Green Goblin. He's a Halloween character. And even though he doesn't have a purple hat or pumpkin bobs in this, he still looks sinister. He just has this green metallic suit that took 30 minutes to put on him. And instead of a pumpkin bomb, like he still had goldenish orange ball bomb balls that would just explode anything but the most terrifying one is when uh when norman osborn was kicked off the his um kicked out of his company pretty much they told him you got to resign in 30 days gave him an ultimatum and he later on goes to kill those board members that pretty much fired him and the bomb just goes off and turns them into straight up skeletons i mean that's fucking horrifying and not only that when green goblin attacks the world's fair 
his son and his son's girlfriend, Harry Osborne and Mary Jane, were both chilling with the chairman. So when Green Goblin came here to wreck shit, he had no regards for his son's life. I mean, it's, it's the beauty of being a villain. And Norman Osborn, you know, Green Goblin in this, know that shit. Willem Dafoe also knows it with his voice as the Green Goblin. It's just he something so sinister about it. And l- later on when um, he sort of sets up Spider-Man with an ultimatum where he's like, join me, we could rule things or, you know, we'll just keep on fighting until one of us dies and who knows how many casualties will die as we continue fighting. So it's a great scene as well. Like I, I never realized that as a kid, like what he was really telling him. I just thought, no, yeah, do your thing, Spidey. Hell no. Fuck Green Goblin, but as an adult, I'm like, damn. It's pretty crazy how, like, being a superhero, there's so much responsibilities. And that's what Sam Raimi does. And uh, Sam Raimi does it well. I mean, he's a big comic book collector. I mean, Sam Raimi was chosen to direct this movie mainly because he's a comic book nerd. Dude owns a shit ton of them. I mean, he directed a movie called Dark Man back in the 90s. Uh, I think it's called Dark Man. But it stars Liam Neeson, and it's a superhero movie, and he made it up himself. I mean, he wanted, he saw Batman, Tim Burton's Batman. He was like, yo, I want to do a superhero movie. And he didn't know when he would get offered one or if anyone was really looking to do one. So he made Dark Man. And Sonny, you know, after a couple other directors had passed or they just felt wouldn't get the right, you know, vibe that they were envisioning. They got Sam Raimi to do it, and yeah, I mean, as a comic book lover, that dude poured his heart and soul into this shit, probably. I mean, Spider-Man 3, for as much flack as uh, as it gets, uh, it wasn't even supposed to go down like that. It was supposed to be a different type of movie. He even envisioned it so differently, but hey, studios, you know, they always got to get involved with a director's vision, a writer's fucking, you know, script. Because that's what they do. They just got to make it their way. They got to try to make it profitable. Or they just want to be able to sell more merchandise. I don't know what it is. But studios can never let the vision of a director happen. Then we also have Kristen Dunst and James Franco. Who play like a backseat role in this. Mainly the focus is on Peter Parker. Because obviously it's Spider-Man. And it's his origin story beginning kind of film. And then Willem Dafoe is his first villain. That sort of shows him that you got to keep your identity a secret no matter how much you want to tell Mary Jane that you're Spider-Man or you want to tell May you're Spider-Man. If someone finds out, they'll put him in danger. And that's what William Dafoe as Green Goblin does. He puts Mary Jane Watson in danger near the end of the film. And, you know, May, Aunt May, like in the, like close to the end, but not so much. And yeah, so these actors they are i don't want to shit on them well i'm not going to shit on rosemary harris she's actually a great actress but i mean james franco has never done it for me i mean he's had a couple roles where he's good in them but i'm never convinced oh yeah that's another character it's always like yeah that's james franco playing blah 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 so that's him but i mean here he plays a rich smug kid who has a lot of emotional problems and i mean he plays it well i mean it He sort of fits it. And then Kristen Dunst, uh, like, she's not a bad actress. She's not an amazing actress, but she's an actress that you can tell enjoys acting. So you sort of just root for her in whatever she's in. Like, no matter what Kristen Dunst is in, when I see her, I always go, oh, it's Kristen Dunst. And I I always seem to enjoy her in here. I mean, I love her as Mary Jane Watson. I mean, it's my OG. It's my OG Mary Jane. So I guess that's why. She is so great in this for me, but she plays that whole girl next door thing really well. Then we have Cliff Robertson, Rosemary Harris as the Parkers. And Cliff Robertson is only in this for a bit, but he knocks it out the park, especially the scene where Spider-Man or Peter Parker tells him, you're not my dad, so quit acting like it. And the broken face on Cliff's man, like the, the broken face Cliff has, like he creates for Ben is just like, damn, you know what you said. And that shit hurt. But it's all good, man. And when he dies, I I forgot that he doesn't really say anything. He just says Peter, 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 Peter over again. And then he passes. 
I'm like, wow, that shit is deep, bro. I can't imagine being Peter Parker. The last thing you tell him is, so quit acting like my father. And then his last words to you are, Peter, 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 when he's dying, can't get like whatever he wanted to say out. And then Rosemary Harris, I mean, she's blended in all three of them. She's always great, Aunt May. You know, she's a wonderful, kind Aunt May that always knows what her, you know, beloved nephew is up to. And she's just terrific. And yeah, you know, that's pretty much the whole cast. And that's, they make the movie a lot more enjoyable than, I mean, than it already is. Because the script ain't too bad. I think it's a perfect blend of comic book wackiness, but also seriousness. And also, I guess it could have been written a lot more better for Peter to be a lot more snippy because a lot of his jokes are very <sighs> mid thirties dad, I guess, instead of a teenager, because some of the jokes he just throw, I'm like, man, that's not funny. That's just like a dad joke or just something a dad would say. So I guess that could have been a lot more better. Some more Peter Parker esque catchphrase, not catchphrases, but you know, quips and, you know, one liners, some zingers, Especially with someone as serious as Willem Dafoe, it just would have been a great dynamic of, a, you know, an 18-year-old versus a fucking 40-year-old who just took steroids practically. So uh, that could have been a lot more better. The love triangle, I hate it. I mean, I hate most love triangles in films. It always makes me go like, oh, here we go. Why can't someone just be the adult and say, I like this person. My bad, bro. Do you like them? If you want to, you know, just talk it out. I, I, I. Love triangles in movies always makes us go like, oh, but hey, I think you, everyone needs a dynamic. You know, you got to have a love situation. So obviously, James Franco and Mary Jane, they're together, right? They end up together and then they break up because, you know, Mary Jane end up, ends up falling for Peter. And because like she realizes Peter Parker has loved him my whole life. And Peter has been in love with Mary Jane since elementary school. And, no, and uh, Harry knows this, right? But Harry still ends up dating Kristen Dunst after what the graduation is like when he went up because she ended up breaking up with Flash Thompson. Oh, shout out to my boy Joe from Magic Mike in this. I didn't even realize that was him until Lori pointed out. She's like, hey, isn't that that guy? That guy, Joe? Joe? And I'm like, oh, John Manda. I know. I'm sorry. But yeah, I was like, homeboy from Magic Mike, the D&D dude, the Dungeons and Dragons man. Yeah, that's him. So, you know. Harry just weaseled in his, his way in there like a rebound, a proud rebound. He was like, ha ha, don't trip, bro. Here I am. But he knows Peter Parker has like feelings for her. Whatever. And he doesn't even tell him. That's a dickish part. Like, like I said, you know, Harry Osborne in this is just a piece of shit, like a conniving asshole uh, who loves Peter Parker like a brother, but still is like his crush because he's like, yeah, Peter's never going to have a chance. But then when Peter Parker finally swoops in and takes Mary Jane, how does he act? He gets all whiny and bitchy. He goes crying to his dad going, dad, dad, you right. She was just using me. She loves Peter. You know, it's just like, bro, you, what you took her. You, I mean, come on, man. It just makes no sense. Love triangles. It just, it doesn't, but I mean, it sort of is put in there for you, you know, green goblin to find out that, oh, Peter loves Mary Jane. Mary Jane, she is my next victim. I'm a kidnapper. So, I mean, that's what it leads to. I mean, those are the only two downsides of the movie that I really just don't care for. Just the whole Peter Parker not really being Peter Parkery, But it is what it is. Everyone has their own visions for their own things. And then the love triangle. But I guess it's supposed to lead us to that wonderful discovery that Peter loves Mary Jane. And I like that ultimatum, too, when Green Goblin pretty much at the end of the film has um, Mary Jane and like, a, I guess, is it a field trip? I mean, it looks like it's late. It looks like it's 6, 7 p.m., 8 p.m. tops. And there's a field trip going who knows where these kids are on on the gondola. That's what it is, gondola, right? Like, what were they doing at a field trip so late? I don't know. But, you know, I love when Greek Goblin has to give him an ultimatum. It's like, you got to save Mary Jane or you can save the kids. And it's just true evil. And, Sp you know, Spider-Man, Sp I was going to say Speederman. Uh, Spider-Man, he saves them both because he's badass. Oh, 
one great thing about this movie is the action, how it's sprinkled pretty well throughout the film. I mean, sometimes it's not a lot of action sequences, but just something cool and kick ass like Green Goblin pretty much coming into Aunt May's house, scaring the shit out of her, sending her to the hospital or when Green Goblin blows up um jj jameson's office you know asking who the person is that steals spider-man's pictures or when green goblin blows up his um competition like his the weapon competition that he's against and he blows their shit up causing them to not buy his company oscorp so yeah a lot of like explosions that the green goblin does is tight and horrific i mean sam raimi is a horror director originally if you haven't seen the evil dead series I suggest you check check them out. The first one is like one of those scary sillies, but as they go on, it just becomes funnier and funnier. So I suggest you check them out. So since he has that horror element in him, I think that's what Green Goblin does well for those explosion scenes and that he looks like a, a monster, a jump scare almost, you know, something to freak you out. It's not like a scary movie scare, but it's uh, a superhero movie scare, I guess, you know, he does that really well. And also the action sequences and the maze fair when Spider-Man and Green Goblin finally show down for the first time. It's just fast, not a lot of cuts. The punches are just, you know, connecting. It's done so well, not a lot of, you know, stunt coordination happening, just a straight up brawl between the two of them. I mean, to, uh, Peter Parker has never really fought in his life, so right now he's just doing what he feels. So that's why everything feels a lot more one-two punch kind of thing, and maybe that's why Green Goblin over really overpowers him. You know, Spider Man is just learning to become Spider Man. He's learning the superhero ropes, and Green Goblin just beats the shit out of him easily every time. So at the Mayfair, he beats him up, and the only way Spider Man really wins is using his brain, because that's what Spider Man does. By fucking up his glider, causing him to fly away, Team Rocket esque. Uh, then we move on to their second fight, which is in like pretty much the fire um, in that apartment complex, where pretty much Spider Man has a fucking warrant for his arrest. I always thought that was hilarious that the cops are looking to arrest Spider Man, so he has a you know a, a warrant, and he ends up showing up at a fire, and he's about to get you know handcuffed by the fucking NYPD. And he's some ladies yelling. So it's like, someone's in there. He needs to save them. And they tell him, yeah, go do it, but come right back. I'm like, come on. Come on. You really think? And he, I'm glad Peter's like, this is one of those like Peter Parker lines where he goes, if I go in there, I'm not coming back. And then he just jumps up. I'm like, great. So once he goes in there and they sort of have a showdown between themselves, it's dope because, I mean, that yell Green Goblin does when he turns around freaks me out every time. It's just a weird shriek that he does. Like, does he have that? implanted in the helmet like what is it or the mask at least i don't know but it's a dope fucking fight scene it reminds me sort of like the matrix when fucking peter's dodging all those blades and then their third and final fight scene i mean well that uh, before i get to that one like that one peter wins because he just sort of dodges everything goes back to green goblin he, he needs to get out because there's a fire this shit's about to blow so he got out there luckily because they were in a fire and they both knew well we both gotta go and then the third fight, once again, you know, Peter Parker's just getting his ass kicked. And I'm just saying Peter because Spider-Man don't get his ass kicked. So Peter Parker's just getting his ass handed to him by the Green Goblin. And he beats him so bad, his mask starts ripping. Uh, he's bleeding from his mouth. I mean, he's just wrecking havoc. The only reason Green Goblin ends up losing the fight is due to spider senses. You know, everything that... Peter learns in this movie, he takes to the next one. But for this one, since it's a fresh thing, he just gets his ass handed to him and he almost dies. But thanks to Spider-Sense, he avoids the glider's blade, but it impacts Green Goblin killing him. Because, I mean, Norman, Green Goblin, he would have not stopped at all until Peter was dead. Like, he was looking for blood because he knew Spider-Man was going to stop him from whatever he wanted to do, no matter what. So, yeah, I mean, the action sequences are dope. I mean, everything is awesome when it comes to action. There's not a moment where you're missing any of it because it's you're given something at least every 15 to 20 minutes. And that's great. I mean, I, I really love this movie. And like just like I like the X-Men uh, movie, the first one and X2 with Nightcrawler. 
I guess this is sort of like my Iron Man. This is sort of my Ant Man. This is my Batman from the 80, uh, 89. This is my Superman from 1978. You know, this is my introduction to not superheroes per se, because I watched a lot of cartoonery, but this is my introduction to a big screen superhero, you know, something I was able to see in theaters and be blown away with it, which is why I always like, you know, has a hold a special place in my heart. And I mean, I've seen this movie o- over at least 20 times. This is the first time I watched it in years. And I was surprised that I was able to know certain lines still, even though I haven't seen the movie in years. So, I mean, it's something that is implanted in my brain of that. This one in Spider-Man 2 and Spider-Man 3, I've watched them over and over. I mean, Spider-Man is one of my favorite superheroes. And, I mean, Tobey Maguire, not the perfect Peter Parker, but a decent Spider-Man, a decent Peter Parker. You know, he's pretty good. Tom Holland really takes the crown for best Spider-Man, but Tobey Maguire holds a special place in my heart. But the movies do, too. I mean, they're pretty realistic in a sense. But the movie also has some wacky moments, like where... um, Fuck. Oh, when um, Green Goblin is, you know, threatening Spider-Man with the kids in the gondola and Kristen Dunst, the New Yorkers start throwing shit at Green Goblin, causing him to get distracted and have, like, Peter save everyone kind of thing. I always love that scene because when you think about it, Spider-Man probably would have lost that too. But if it hasn't been for the New Yorkers, who knows, you know? You know, if it wasn't for the New Yorkers, he would have lost it. I'm just saying. But thanks to the New Yorkers, Spider-Man won that part of the battle. And the New Yorkers get credit. New Yorkers won Green Goblin Zero. And it's going to stay like that because he died. So New Yorkers be, are undefeated against Green Goblin. Also, that scene was included because it was uh, a year almost. Well, not this one came out in April. So, you know, it's been a couple months after 9-11. So that scene was added to show unity in New York. So, I mean, that's a good shout out from Sam Raimi and the writers. Yeah, but... I'm just saying, New Yorkers over Green Goblin. Or, you know, obviously Green Goblin pretending to be a woman or a child or a teenager, whoever he was pretending to be. And then he comes out looking all freaky. But the movie is just fantastic, man. I mean, it's it still holds up. I mean, I like Sam Raimi, so everything he's really done is great. I'm excited for him to do the new Doctor Strange film. I feel like he said it's going to be a horror film, so... Fingers crossed. Uh, hopefully, we see you know Tobey Maguire back. That'd be amazing. I'll probably cry to be honest if Tobey Maguire shows up in the new Spider-Man. I mean, or the Doctor Strange film, or even in the new Spider-Man movie. I don't know what's going on, but I I pretty much I'll cry if Tobey Maguire shows up, or even Willem Dafoe. Maybe even Kristen Dunn. No, I wouldn't cry if Kristen Dunn shows up. I'd just probably be like, woo, you know, J.K. Simmons. He's already back, so it doesn't even matter. But yeah. Spider-Man 3. You guys want to hear some facts? Because if you do, well, I'm going to just name them right now. In that scene where Peter Parker catches Mary Jane's lunch on the tray, it involved no CGI. With the help of a sticky substance to keep the tray planted on his hand, uh, he did it eventually after 156 takes. He performed the stunt exactly as seen, so I appreciate that. I mean, as a kid, or not even as a kid until, you know, recently i, I had learned read about this fact a couple years ago but until recently i always thought that was cgi but that's pretty dope Tommy mcguire had never read a spider-man comic book but he took the role because he liked the script though by the time spider-man 2 was about to the um it was about to start their production he almost got fired because he lied of an injury to get a little bit of more of a bonus to um do part two but later on they found out that he was lying about it so he almost got fired and replaced with jake gyllenhaal but jake gyllenhaal obviously did not get the role because tom mcguire had to do a public apology to the cast and producers and everyone so i mean shit i mean pretty foolish of toby mcguire to try to do that uh hugh jackman was supposed to have a cameo in this movie but he ended up not because the crew could not get the X-Men costume, his Wolverine costume. Willem Dafoe performed about 90% of his own stunts. 
This is the first movie to showcase the Marvel logo, the flipping the pages of the Marvel logo. Uh, I already said the whole Sam Raimi being an avid comic book collector. I think one of his first projects, he sold a couple comics to um, fund it, but he ended up and getting it all back. So that's cool. Oh, for to sign off for two sequels, the paycheck was twenty six million. So Tobey Maguire had a twenty six million dollar contract that he almost threw down the drain because he wanted to get paid a little bit more. So he faked an injury. I don't know. Sam Raimi chose the Green Goblin, so he felt that the father son theme would make the film a lot more deeper. You know, between Norman, Harry, and Peter, which I also didn't like. I mean, Peter already had Uncle Ben his whole life, and he just met Norman. Is there really much of a father thing going on other for than, than him paying for his school or whatnot? That's about it. You know, there really is no father son, th- son theme that I saw. But at the same time, I have no father. So what is the theme of that? Anyway, let's continue on. As the Green Goblin costume contained of 580 pieces and it took half an hour to put on, it was released on the 40th anniversary of uh, the Sp- Spider-Man uh, release on comics geez i butchered that but pretty much it was released on the 40th anniversary of spider-man david fincher was asked to direct his version would have been told of the origin story in the opening credits and it would have been based on the night gwen stacy died so instead of mary jane probably would have had a bit more gwen stacy originally but i mean when you think about it imagine david fincher doing a spider-man movie that's fucking wild bro i pay to see that please sir james franco and toby Maguire aren't too friendly with each other they actually have a bit of a rivalry james franco jokingly said that toby Maguire has frog-like features on set and toby Maguire was pissed at that and he doesn't like talking to james franco and they never really formed a friendship after that which is fucking i don't know childish i mean you gotta do like you you worked with this guy for five years and you never once talked to him it is like at some point you just got to get over it because I'm pretty sure James Franco laughed about it. He's like, my bad, man. And Tobey Maguire's like, nah, nah, man. You guys seen that video of uh, Tobey Maguire yelling at paparazzis when they're surrounding him? Like, I totally get why he's yelling at him, but like, it's just I've never seen him look so angry other than Brothers. Have you guys seen that movie, Brothers? That's a pretty damn good movie. Also, I just saw the trailer for Cherry that has Tom Holland, you know, Spider-Man. And I guess every Spider-Man has done a war movie, right? Tobey Maguire did Brothers. Um, Andrew Garfield did, oh my God, what is that movie? But the one where he plays a, a, a soldier that doesn't believe in violence. And all he does is save, like, not all he does, but he saves, like, over 100 wounded people, like, by praying i don't know it's a great movie if you guys want to check it out it's a fucking that shithead mel gibson directs i think but it's a damn good movie and now you have tom holland in this movie called cherry so hey interesting that the spider folks are doing military films sometime in their career makes sense though i mean spider-man the military is just two different aspects you got to knock both of them out and then we also have, during the fight between uh, Green Goblin and Spider-Man, near the end, William Defoe accidentally clipped Tobey Maguire in the chin with one blow. When I read that, I wondered, does Tobey Maguire have gripe with William Defoe by that? No, he probably doesn't. It was an accident, but I can only imagine if Tobey would have been pissed or how he would have reacted. I mean, William Defoe would have been like, calm down, man. And I would have been like, oh, yeah, dude. Don't... I'm sorry, bro. Sorry. Sorry, man. Uh other actors considered to play J.J. Jameson. Uh, this is interesting because it would have been just every actor would have just brought in a different uh, feel. We got Art Lee Ermey, who, if you don't know, is a legit drill sergeant. He has a very popular role in Full Metal Jacket when he's yelling at all the soldiers. Hugh Laurie. I'm pretty sure that's Dr. House, right? That's what everyone knows him as. Harv Purcell, Dennis Farina, Michael Keaton, Batman. That's pretty dope, which is funny considering that if he would have been J.J. Jameson, it would have been good. And then he would have been like later on in this film, he would have been the Birdman and J.J. Crazy. Fred War and Bill Paxton. I'm surprised Bill Paxton never got it. Stan Lee was almost considered, but apparently they just decide, nah, it doesn't feel right. And he was cool with it, but he always thought... 
that he could be J.J. Jameson. So that would have been dope. Chris Columbus was offered the role original, I mean, the role to direct originally, but instead he decided to do Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. So, I mean, he ended up that working out for him. So good job, Chris Columbus. Both Tobey Maguire and William Dafoe started doing yoga so they could feel more flexible. They also did a spider-like yoga sesh, which is, I guess they thought it would be funny, you know. And the studio expressed interest in Leonardo DiCaprio and Freddie Prince Jr. playing the part of Spider-Man. Leo DiCap and Tobey Maguire are actually BFFs in real life, so I don't know how Leo would have felt. I mean, Tobey would have felt if Leo just stole the role from him. Or not even stole, but he was just like, yeah, I'll take it. I don't know if there would have been bad blood. Scott Speedman and James Franco were all also tested for the part. James Franco didn't get it, but he auditioned for Harry because they're like, yo, you might be a good Harry. Worked out for him at the end. Stayed in this trilogy. In the final battle between Spider-Man and the Goblin, the CG artist had to change the color of the blood pouring from Spider-Man's mouth to clear liquid indicating spit. This was to ensure a PG-13 rating. Is that bullshit, bro? Like, come on. It's just blood. Everyone bleeds. Like, what are you, what are you trying to hide? I knew it was blood. It was white, but... I don't know why Spider-Man would have been dripping all that drool, you know? I don't know. Fucking studios. Fucking MPAAA. Before William Dafoe received the role of Green Goblin, Nicolas Cage, John Malkovich, Bill Paxson, Mel Gibson. Oh, hey, look, the shithead. John Travolta, Brad Dourif, and Robert De Niro were offered the role. Out of all these, Nicolas Cage and Robert De Niro would have been my top two picks. I mean... Nicolas Cage loves superhero movies. He named his son Kal-El. And if you don't know who Kal-El is, that is Superman's like original name. Not Clark, but like Kal-El from the planet. So, I mean, dude loves his superhero movies. He was going to be in a super Superman movie. He was going to be Superman. And it was direct going to be directed by, uh, I want to say either Tim Burton or Kevin Smith. If you look up Nicolas Cage Superman costume, you'll see him in it. Like, they legit were ready to do it. He was going to be... Superman, so I feel like Nicolas Cage probably would have brought the same exact craziness that Willem Dafoe brings, but obviously Nicolas Cage has a different voice, so it probably would have just been a lot more frightening, like a dad yelling at you. And then Robert De Niro, I mean, it was already the 2000s, you know, 2002, he was up in like, what, his 50s, and he's almost 70, 80 now, so yeah, I mean, that would have been interesting. I don't think it would have worked out too well, but he's a damn good actor. But too bad. In another universe, you know, or maybe, you know, the Spider-Man movies that are coming out of the future that are the verse, they should just get these actors to do it. But it's just not the same. Only like whoever's listening to this podcast, me or anyone that knows these facts would get it. But that's cool. Norman Osborn, if you realize his whole house is decorated with masks, the filmmakers did this to suggest that Norman is a collector of masks, thus offering an explanation of how he was able to provide a mask for his Green Goblin outfit. So those little things that you're just like, hell yeah, bro, that's pretty smart. William Dafoe's own face bears an uncanny resemblance to the original Green Goblin mask. I think that's why he just like works. Because when you look at the old ones, it's like, damn, man, he just looks diabolical. Or why does he look creepy? I don't know. But why does he seem like he might be the sweetest guy you'll ever meet? Because it's Willem Dafoe, man. Oh, yeah, The Dark Man. It was released in 1990, a year after Batman. So, yeah, he really made his own superhero movie. And then other than Chris Columbus, Tim Burton, Tony Scott, Jan DeBont, James Cameron, Roland Emmerich, Ang Lee, David Fincher, and M. Night Shyamalan were thought to probably maybe direct this film. But instead, it went to our boy, Sam Raimi. But yeah, that was Spider-Man 2. I hope you enjoy my episode. Like, subscribe, do whatever you want. Tell your friends about it or not. Share my podcast. Hit me up on Twitter at Hours of Movies. Suggest the movie. Tell me what you like about Spider-Man or what you do not like about it. Whatever it is, I hope you have a good one. I hope you have a good day, good night, good evening, whatever it is. And yeah, take care.